Our program today is not a town hall. It's not a public meeting. It's not a debate. Uh, we really want you guys to be able to meet our speakers and talk to them uh, directly. So, and with each other also. We want you to really enjoy this presentation. So with that, I want to introduce our first speaker, Aaron Everett. So Aaron is a forester with roots in the concrete jungle. Um, escaping to the outdoors was special for a kid from the Detroit area. Um, this coupled with a little sense of adventure led him to enroll in forestry school at Michigan Tech University. Located a nine hours drive north at the far reaches of the state's upper peninsula, the population there is about 7,300. Uh, many paths along the forestry profession start with the welcome solitude of cruising around the woods. But Aaron has spent almost his entire career at the intersection of public issues around forestry, so policy, politics, people. Um, he's now the Washington State Forester and Policy Director at the Department of Natural Resources. So this is a 1,500 uh, employee agency with broad land management, regulatory, geology, and wildfire protection responsibilities across millions of acres. So with that, I want to turn it over to Aaron. Looking out uh, at your faces today, you know, I'm struck by an overwhelming feeling, an undeniable and obvious conclusion that I've come to. You are all geniuses. And you're going to change the world. Are you ready? I say that because inside you is an inspiration. You're here in this room together because of it. It brought you here. By walking through those doors over there, you started something already. If you didn't think that's why you came here today, then I'm really that much more happy that I'm here to tell you. But you're here to spark and inspire and be an agent of change in the world, and it's a lot of responsibility. But I know you're up for it. I'm pretty excited to be in a room full of world-changing geniuses. I hope you're excited, too. I want you to turn to your neighbor or the nearest person that you don't already know, and don't cheat, and we have name tags. Don't cheat, OK? And introduce yourself. I want you to tell them in a couple of words what you're a genius in. It doesn't have to be about your work or your education, but it could be we're here for a forestry talk. It could be anything that sparks your passion or your imagination. So go ahead. I'll give you a couple minutes. All right, geniuses. All right, I'm gonna go Tony Robbins on you. I'm walking around the crowd. I gotta know. I gotta know what kind of brilliance is in the room. Okay, so you didn't think there was gonna be an exam. Okay, who's the lucky customer? Al. I'm very passionate about the backcountry and the mountains and the wilderness, and just really enjoy a career that allows me to enjoy that. Awesome. Thank you. My passionate issue is productivity and the ways in which uh, often regulation and, and compromise chips away at the productivity of the forest lands. And I don't think we understand the real consequences of that. Fair enough. We've got history. We've got productivity. We've got backcountry. What other genius have we in the room today? Hey, listen. Um, I. I don't know whether I'm a genius at this, but I just thoroughly enjoy working in the forestry sector and inspiring people um, who will do great things for their children and future generations. That's me. Inspiration and future generations. Hi, I'm Jacob. Um, I guess uh, something that I'm a genius in is I enjoy going on a lot of waterfall hikes, so I'm a genius in chasing waterfalls. All right. <laughs> We're going to find out in probably about 40 minutes if I'm a genius at making connections between forests and people. But I want you to know who you have in the room with you today. And, and as was said in the introduction, this is a conversation. So get ready for a little more of this as we go further along. I'm the Washington State Forester, which is a title I thought was a little bit ironic for, to describe a suit-wearing bureaucrat at a government agency but I've been honored to bear it nonetheless. 
At Washington Department of Natural Resources, we're about a 1,500 uh, employee organization managing extensive forest and agricultural land, aquatic tideland and bedland, fighting wildfires, conserving and protecting natural landscapes, assessing geologic hazard, conserving uh, rare species, regulating timber harvest practices. But that's not really what we do. We help children have a place to go to school, help people have clean drinking water. We help protect people's way of life. We protect them from wildfires. We protect them from landslides and tsunamis and earthquakes. We help people's communities improve by caring for their trees and forests. We help native people have healthy salmon runs to carry on their thousands of years of culture. We help people find joy in being outdoors. We help people have a home, a roof over their head, a place to raise their family. That's my job. Those are some of the things we do for people that inspired me to get here. Forestry, to me, is not really about commodities or regulations or recreation or revenue. We need to be skillful at those things to be certain. But that's not the, what the work is about. It's about people. It's about connecting with the natural world in a way that cares for their needs and for the environments. Today, my job is to help fan your spark of imagination and see what takes hold, and I'm excited to do it. I'll share some of my story with you. I'll connect it to what I think are a few inspiring ideas, challenges in society uh, that perhaps forestry can help solve. And I hope as we talk, it'll feed your inner genius some more and I can draw upon your inner genius to help us start to define a new future for forestry. When I was little, we had a tiny strip of woods in the backyard, not much more than some uncleared brush and a few maples along a fence line that survived the developers. But for me, it was enough to bring to life my first little spark of forestry, a spark of connection, of imagination, of adventure, a sense of unexplored reaches of the world and of wonder at small things that made this little wisp of remnant forest come alive as part of something bigger. It was a window into my imagination, a place that helped me escape and dream. And maybe this particular memory comes to mind because there's honestly no other explicable reason on earth that I am a forester. I'm the son of a healthcare professional, a government executive in civil engineering, and a home repair builder slash musician. The rest of my relatives, teachers, union activists, artists, printers, electricians, realtors, auto workers, engineers, pilots, lawyers, and so on, all wonderful and inspiring people, but this is all to say it wasn't exactly in the blood. And my environment outside that little strip of woods, well, the areas we lived growing up in suburban Detroit had natural beauty, lakes and parks. But in the end, I'm from a city of steel and grit and gasoline. A culture where the natural world is about the farthest thing from mind. And as I think about the culture of Detroit, maybe the closest thing about it to naturalness is its own version of natural selection. And I'm specifically referring to a souvenir t-shirt I remember being widely sold that said, Detroit, where the weak are killed and eaten. In any event, it's an unusual place for a forester to be from. But that spark, it was born there nonetheless. When it came time to decide what I wanted to do for college, I guess I first decided I wanted to be far from home, as you've already heard. I picked Michigan Tech University, incidentally another tough place to be from, with about a two-thirds washout raid and 300 inches of snow drifted up among the pines of the Lake Superior shore. But there, I'm grateful I followed the spark into forestry school. After talking my way into an advanced forest ecology class my first year, uh, I really knew it had taken hold. I felt such great reward and wonder in unraveling and understanding how it all worked together, how things related and depended upon one another, how to understand them and care for them. It connected me to the imagination that I'd felt in those woods, and it confirmed for me that I did in fact have the outdoors in my blood, running alongside the gasoline, but still there, nonetheless. And I really believe all human beings have it, or we're waiting to have it, not quite knowing what we're missing. Just knowing that we're missing something, it's prehistoric, it's instinctive. 
it's where we came from as a species. We don't all want to wear a loincloth and swing from tree vines, and some of us have a hard enough time with house spiders. But something is always reaching out from the, from the natural world for that connection, that connection to nature, connection to natural things. The smell of grass carried on a warm breeze, the rustle of leaves, the sun on our shoulders. We all feel that. Forestry has a powerful ability to bridge this connection, but you know, we don't think of it that way. Not as a profession and not as a society. In a lot of ways, that's a real puzzle to me. After all, trees literally built this nation from homesteads to cities to suburbs. Rail lines that connected us from coast to coast. Ships that carried our goods and built our economy. These are fundamental things that shaped America. And in turn, America fundamentally shaped the world. So if you're catching my drift, trees shaped the world. Shaped modern civilization in a way. And the building continues today, but it's often unnoticed or unrecognized. And so much of our everyday life is often unwittingly connected to the forest, the walls of wherever we call home, every last stick of furniture underneath that roof, the music we make and the instruments we use to make it with, the touch screens on our smartphones, cleaning the water we drink and the air we breathe. Forests are fundamental, more than just products and services. They're vital infrastructure to the fabric of our lives. Along the way, though, I feel like we got distracted, we as people and we as a profession. After building the nation, we the profession, we sort of kept going. We got more efficient at what we knew, and that seemed like a good thing. But we the society entered a period of affluence, a period where those basic things like food and shelter, they were kind of a given or at least more of a given than they'd ever been before. Now don't get confused, the debate over natural resource management uh, and sustainability has been going on in our country since the 1800s at least. But almost 50 years ago, the calls for more environmental protections really reached a tipping point in the national consciousness. Progress was made, a lot of laws were passed, a lot of debate and conflict took, base, took place over it at, the, at that time and continues today. But that's 50 years of conflict and I have to ask, are we ready for something better than that? Are we ready for something better yet? Can we think of something better yet? Evidently, no one has thought up to this point of getting a room full of world-changing geniuses together, so I'm all the more glad that you're here. I think this can be explained by an old parable. It's about three bricklayers. You'll forgive me for using an analogy about bricks in a talk about forestry, I hope. But here's how it goes. A traveler came across three workers and asked each of them what they were doing. The first said he was miserable. I'm just moving bricks and laying mortar and my work is backbreaking. I'm out here in the elements all day and every day I toil and labor for so little money, it's barely enough to support a family. The traveler kept walking and came upon the second man. When asked what he was doing, he said he was making a living to provide for his family. He focused on doing a good job of straight, consistent mortar and joints to construct a, a strong wall. And while his living was modest, he was happy to provide for his family, happy to provide for his wife and children. He knew why he was there. But he would sure be glad for the end of the day. Beer 30 couldn't come soon enough. Coming upon the third worker, the traveler stopped again. Asked what he was doing, he looked up and simply said, I'm building a cathedral. I'm building a lasting place for people to connect with their spirituality and find peace in life. What this story, what do we think it's about? What does it have to do with forestry? It's tempting to see it as a story about worker productivity. I am an agency guy after all, or organizational motivation. That's why it's often told and that's all well and good, but to me it's about purpose about what our works, our actions, our intent, and how we apply it. What does it mean to the world? What do those things mean to the world? And what we do, after all, is the only real proof of what we believe in. Is your genius spark starting to flicker yet? Our purpose in forestry for a time was to build the nation. 
Now what is it? What do we want it to be? What do people really need from us? Are we outmoded, antiquated? Are we of a bygone time? I think not, but we're flirting with it. I'm not talking about a different way to explain why our environment is important or why forestry is so great. Magic words we can say that would make a person who's never thought about forestry their entire lives wake up in the morning and want to put Bill Hagenstein's hat on. That's not what I'm talking about not interpretive signs or brochures or educational events. We know how to do that. We're pretty good at it. Not words, not messages or talking points or TV ads. We're talking about our purpose, the proof of what we believe, what we do that connects to people. And that's where your genius starts to come in. Let me feed it for a little while with just one example I found, um, I found inspiring and transformative. It's not about forestry, and that's intentional. As I explain it, I want you to be thinking about how your own ideas can transform what we do. Here we go. Have you ever heard of an architecture design firm called Mass, M-A-S-S? -S. It's run by a man named Michael Murphy, and the firm's purpose is to shake up the world of architecture, to make it about, you guessed it, people. Specifically, Mass seeks out problems, basic societal health and welfare problems of people and designs buildings to solve them, to improve their lives in measurable ways. Murphy attended a lecture in which a renowned physician outlined the problem of infectious disease control in medical facilities of developing nations. Hospitals were making people sicker, not better. As the doctor spun his tail, he issued a challenge. Where are the architects? Who is willing to apply their inspiration and spark to making hospitals that really work? So Murphy founded the Mass Group in 2008 around a project to design and build a hospital in Butaro, Rwanda. He called their concept architecture that's built to heal. The hospital project made intentional use of local materials and labor-intensive practices to stimulate the local economy. Excavation, for example, was done by hand, hundreds of local people, using a Rwandan method called ubedehe, meaning community works for the community. Stonework was hand cut using local volcanic rock, a nuisance that farmers had piled up outside their fields and was in ready supply. Furniture was built not by importing it, but by uh, starting a local guild, rather than Bring it from the outside, why don't we teach a lasting skill? Building design emphasized natural ventilation to replace unreliable mechanical systems as one design-based form of infection control. In another facet, the hospital was designed with hallways built on the outside instead of on the inside to limit transmitting disease vectors among patients. Above all, it solved the problem for people and did it in a way that brought prosperity and dignity to their lives. It made them part of something bigger and of something lasting. This firm is an ambassador of the field of architecture. This firm knows what purpose is all about. It's nice. Heartwarming, Aaron. Good story. Maybe a little impractical to turn forestry into and environmental issues into works of charity. I can see your skepticism, but not so fast. Okay, look at our history of purpose. We've helped the nation expand and put people back to work after many of our darkest times. I'm talking about the first two world wars and Vietnam. We helped the nation through the depression with the Civilian Conservation Corps. We have our roots deep in helping our nation solve big problems. We've been part of great things. And back to Butaro for a minute, through a more practical lens, this approach reduced the facility's price tag roughly two-thirds of what it would have cost otherwise. We can make these things come together if we have the desire to find that inspiration. The Butaro Hospital Project was only the first of several around the world for Mass. They built another hospital in Haiti that's using natural design to help end a cholera epidemic. They've built a birthing center in Malawi that's reducing the chronically high rate of uh, infant mortality there. They've built a conservation center in the Congo to help end poaching for ivory and bushmeat. 
which maybe sounds like a nice to do project, until you consider the nation's long history of war and famine caused by conflicts over resources there. Closer to home, the firm is revitalizing abandoned industrial buildings in Rust Belt cities, something close to my heart, and creating centers of culture and growth. Architecture that's built to heal. So imagine what forestry built to heal looks like. What could it do? What would we accomplish? What would our cathedral be? Well, we have to start with a purpose. So let's spend a minute listing just a few of those possibilities. Our cities have a homelessness and low-income housing needs. Our water supply is straining against population growth and the impacts of climate change. And oh yeah, climate change. That's kind of a big deal. I think we have something to contribute to that. Our parents' generation is reaching an age when we'll face unprecedented challenges providing for those who need health care and housing. Retirement savings haven't kept up. What can forestry do for that problem? Our returning military veterans need work and a way to transition back into a fulfilling life stateside. Our children are suffering from nature deficit. And our education system is still struggling to provide them with the basic knowledge and, and, uh, and skills that they need to be successful. Our rural communities continue to struggle with basic economic and social viability. And the connection between our rural and urban populations is growing weaker all the time. Our communities in the western United States, hundreds of thousands of people each year, suffer through the impacts, the displacement, the property loss, the, the economic uh, suffering of longer, more intense wildfire seasons. I think forestry has something to contribute to that. Can you think of a few others? You can see the microphone starting to come back around, can't you? <laughs> now, we're working on these problems. We are. I don't mean to say that we aren't. Increasingly, I see groups of people and organizations dedicated to solution-based purposes that harness forests and the natural world to benefit people and solve the problems of today. Forestry built to heal. Nationally, we might look to organizations like the American Forest Foundation, Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, the Arbor Day Foundation, to name only a few. Regionally, I think of groups like Sustainable Northwest, Ecotrust, Friends of Trees, one of our fine sponsors here today, the Pinchot Institute, and of course, these hallowed halls of the World Forestry Center where discussions like the first of the Hagenstein lectures are happening. These organizations are the early adopters of a movement. They, they create bridges between environmental and economic needs. They see the power of uniting around a common purpose instead of dividing among interests and philosophies. But we're not yet really a team. We don't quite have the unity of purpose that really sparks a movement. We haven't achieved world-changing genius status just yet. But this is where you came in. I didn't know Bill Hagenstein personally. I didn't even know of him until the center called to ask me to be with you here today. Some of you were very close friends of his and are carrying on his inspiration. But I'm betting many others of you are in the room or in the same boat as I am. I'm grateful for him for this opportunity. He and I shared a lot that I didn't even know about. Just this morning, for example, Steve Wylant shared a story about Bill that involved a long hike back into the woods uh, to look at some timber that ended up with drinking martinis on a stump, I assume. Now this is a man after my own heart. But more to the point, Bill and I share a vision for an ongoing dialogue about where we're going from here. And today we're getting started on it. And I think this is so important because most of the public conversations we've had about forestry, as I said before, maybe even some that we'll hear about later today, have been pretty much all about conflict. And looking back, I guess that was natural. We don't tend to get motivated to do things unless there's some kind of crisis. And largely, our crises have been about trade-offs between economic benefits and environmental protection. At least that's how we've thought about them up to this point. I'm tired of it. I spent 15 years seeing it play out that way. And in a short time, I suppose, considering many of my colleagues have spent their entire careers straining under that yoke, 
I'm tired of it. There are trade-offs in the directions we take. That's real. At Department of Natural Resources, in my time there, I've lived that. I understand it. And I'm okay with a good fight. Those who know me might even say sometimes I enjoy it. But there's a big difference between fighting for something and just fighting about something. There's simply no good reason for our direction, our purpose, that has to be about defined by jobs versus the environment or other false sort of binary choices between two imaginary outcomes that neither of which really even exist. It's preposterous to think that way. And we, should, we need to stop. It's like living inside one long multiple choice exam where all the answers are wrong. But today, and throughout the, Hagen, the series of Hagenstein lectures, we have an opportunity to learn from one another, to harness your genius, and start to define a shared purpose. Forestry needs that conversation. And no, despite my telling stories about helping babies in Malawi, I'm not an altruist about the realities of the world. I use those examples because they help sharpen the contrast between things that really make a difference to people and things people simply want to argue and debate. I've come to know that Bill was a colorful guy. His opening statement of the, uh, of the conference being one good example. And I imagine he might have said that if all you want to do is debate, all you'll become is a master debater. And we're better than that. The choices about our future are not binary, this thing versus that thing, only two options. We should reject that premise and look instead for transformative things we could be doing that are in the service of making a difference. Being a persuasive debater is fine, but I'm asking you to imagine what it would be like if our purpose and our actions did the talking. And I'm not here because I already know what that purpose is. If you were waiting for that punchline, I'm going to disappoint you. But you're not going to disappoint me. I'm here because I want to know. You're here because you want to know. I want to find out. I want to learn it from you. Because I need the help of geniuses to find it. So I'm putting you to work. I want you to turn back to your fellow geniuses now and take a break from listening to me for a moment. And I want you to think of what's one problem that trees and forests can solve for people. If you want to write it down, that's fine. You know it's coming. So you've been listening to me now for whatever, it's been a half an hour or something, and I know you've got some great ideas. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that. Write them down so you don't forget, and we'll come back and talk about them. Okay, I don't want to interrupt your genius work because it sounds like there's a lot of it going on. But now's the time when I'm going to come ask you about it. Okay, I know absolutely nothing about forestry. I don't work in forestry at all, but I think that it's vital for the argument to change from enterprise versus ecology to a conversation about how they can work together to support one another. I don't know that it's possible for our enterprises to continue operating in the way that they are without that cooperation, because if we destroy the systems that make our businesses possible, uh, our entire way of living is going to collapse. So uh, if we want to continue living the lifestyle that we live, we have to support the systems that support the air that we breathe and the water that we drink. and um, our entire environment, so. It turns out we do, in fact, have a room full of geniuses. I think we agree. Danielle? Let's hear it. Awesome. I had, we had a, a little group over here that was working really hard, uh, thinking really hard. It looked like there was some, some spark going on over here. Who wants to tell me what that was? Don? Steve? Russ? Russ. Russ is excited for the opportunity. Okay. Let's hear it, Russ. I'll try. Um, so this is, this is an idea that's already actually happening in the Southwest uh, called community trails and how do you link uh, people's health 
to forests. So I think having our forests be accessible, having, we talked about uh, kids growing up, thinking about nature as a place that they can enjoy and that there are benefits to and not to be afraid of. You know, if you're from an inner city area, it's like, well, I've never been there before. You know, the bears are gonna get me. So just, <laughs> you know, lots of things about, it goes back to communication. You know, just what's a forest? What are the benefits? How can you benefit? How can you access it? All those kinds of things. Now, when I started the talk and I, and I said you were all geniuses, you thought it was just kind of a cheesy device? But listen, I mean, look, I'm so inspired by that. And you, it literally, forests that heal. I, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for making it happen. You bet, man. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. How are we doing for time? Eight minutes. <laughs> A lot of ideas we can hear about for eight minutes from now. Uh, the folks in the middle have been a little too safe, a little too far out of reach. So let's hear it. Hi, I'm Samantha. I'm from Malaysia. And um, my genius inspiration will be building a forest inside a city. And that's what I'm doing also in Malaysia. So we are. Um, cutting down buildings to build trees. Wow. And um, it is not only for, um, because we are restoring an area for a prehistoric bird. Yeah. So we wanted to ensure their survival as well. And um, not only for the wildlife, but also for the communities in our city. So yeah. What a great inspiration. Thank you. Can, can I ask you? Thank you. Can I ask, you know, I said I was from Detroit, right? And, and maybe people know that the, uh, the city of Detroit has fallen on some pretty hard times the last decade or so. Big, big areas of the city that uh, were once historic and beautiful, abandoned, basically. And, and can, can I ask that we do an exchange exchange and you come to Detroit how to tell us how to build a, you know, a, a forest in the middle of the city again? Because we, we don't have a whole lot else going on there. Can we do a, can we do a trade? All right, deal. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I've been thinking about how to um, close a discussion like this and do it in a way that sort of um, doesn't make it seem like a speech, but makes it seem like the start of a conversation because that's what we're here to do. And I think the answer is that I'm not going to close it because we have a wonderful set of refreshments out in uh, the break room. And the purpose of the break is to continue this conversation. Now. There aren't martinis, I'm sad to say, and Bill would be sad to hear, uh, but there is beer and wine. So uh, I'm gonna thank you. I'm gonna thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna thank you for your genius, for your inspiration and your spark, for sharing it with me, and for continuing uh, this conversation, for continuing your, your spark to solve some of the, the problems that forestry can contribute to. I'm so excited for having talked with you today. Thank you so much.